Wrth gynulliad cenedlaethol i drefn yr eitem gyntaf ar yn busnes y prynawn yma yw cwestiynau i'r prefwyn eidog a'r cwestiwn cyntaf Janet Finch Saunders. Diolch llawydd. Will the First Minister make a statement on sepsis prevention? Yes, tackling sepsis continues to be a top patient safety priority in Wales. Early recognition and diagnosis is crucial to preventing the condition getting worse and to the provision of appropriate and timely treatment. And Wales has been recognised at a global level for its work in sepsis awareness and education. Thank you. Research published by Dr. Thomas Sartmani this week has found over 7,500 people were admitted to hospitals in Wales with sepsis, resulting in more than 1,500 deaths. That is more than breast and prostate cancer combined. He also highlights a degree of variation in how clinical teams respond to sepsis, as of 290 patients showing signs of sepsis, just 12% were initially screened and treated in line with best practice. Many of those affected describe the sinister effect arising from such a dangerous and life-threatening disease to include amputations and many life-changing consequences. That's if you survive. A common theme is the blatant lack of awareness, particularly within a health setting. And the saddest part of this is that the majority of cases could be prevented or treated with antibiotics if caught early enough, especially you know, following on. Can you get to a question? Very, you, UTI. England have launched a public health campaign, could it be sepsis? Northern Ireland, the, the just say the sepsis. The question needs and to be Scotland, asked. Yeah. How do you, as First Minister, intend to address the shortfalls and inconsistencies that are evident here in Wales, and how immediately do you intend to do this? Well, we already have in place, of course, the National Early Warning Score System in every hospital. Uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance recognised the work of NHS Wales for its sepsis awareness and education initiatives at the 2016 Global Sepsis uh, Awards, uh, something, of course, which we very much uh, welcome. But, of course, uh, it is still the case that many are not diagnosed in time. It's a difficult condition to, uh, to diagnose, and that is recognised. But it is hugely important that uh, we have consistency across our hospitals uh, in terms of how sepsis is identified early. And that system uh, is something that is in uh, place and is widely used across the Welsh NHS. Rhiannon Passmore. Thank you, Dear Howard. First Minister, the National Confidential Inquiry, as has just been uh, mentioned, into patient outcome and death, published in November 2015, says sepsis kills more people than breast, bowel and prostate cancer combined in the UK. The report recommends more doctors and nurses use early warning systems and screening checklists to prompt them to check for signs of sepsis. The Health Cabinet Secretary says he is open-minded about considering whether to make hospitals screen patients with symptoms in the same way. So will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government can ensure the Welsh National Health ensure a universal and consistent approach to screening for sepsis? Yes, well the National Early, Early Warning Score system is part of that uh, consistent approach. Every hospital uses it. It is a system, a simple system that enables staff to assess whether patients are developing uh, sepsis and also uh, ambulance service paramedics are using that system to uh, develop uh, systems for screening patients for sepsis prior to arrival at, uh, at hospital. Uh, also, staff are using uh, a standard sepsis screening to identify sepsis and instigate rapid action called the seps sepsis six bundle. Uh, and so uh, we are continuing to, uh, to de develop uh, the work that's already been put in place over the last four years to ensure that fewer people, firstly, more people are diagnosed early with sepsis and fewer people lose their lives because of it. Caroline Jones. Uh, uh, First Minister, uh, with nearly 2,000 deaths in Wales each year, many of them preventable, sepsis is one of the biggest killers most people aren't aware of. While educating the public to recognise the signs and ensuring steps are taken in the NHS to prevent the onset of sepsis are vital, so too is ensuring that our healthcare professionals recognise the signs. Many sepsis survivors owe their lives to a GP who recognised the early onset of sepsis. Therefore, First Minister, what steps is the government taking to ensure that every GP in Wales receives training to recognise the signs of sepsis as well as how to prevent it? Well, well building on what I've uh, already, of course, uh, mentioned, I mentioned the sepsis six bundle. That consists of three quick tests for sepsis, three simple treatments, 
that are proven to combat it and can help to detect and treat the illness at its earliest stages. But of course, uh, it is hugely important that all health professionals uh, are aware of sepsis, and indeed they are, and indeed to look for the earliest signs, although uh, it can be difficult to, uh, to diagnose and treat, particularly in the early stages. Question die, Stefan Lewis. Will the First Minister make a statement on the business rate system? Yes, the non-domestic rate system in Wales contributes more than a billion pounds towards the funding of local services in Wales. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, looking ahead to uh, proposals for new business rates arrangements post-2018, is the First Minister able to give an indication of his thinking regarding community sports clubs? I understand that at the moment there's a threshold of 70% of members of such clubs have to be actively participating in that club's activities to qualify for relief. It seems a very high threshold considering uh, wider plans and strategies for greater physical activity promotion, especially uh, among younger people. So I'd appreciate if, this, if the First Minister could give an indication on his thoughts on that matter. Yes, we are aware uh, of the uh, point that the member uh, makes, and it does form part of our thinking uh, to, as we uh, develop a permanent uh, system from 2018 onwards. David Rees. First Minister, on many occasions in this chamber we've heard about the question of relief on plant and machinery in business rates, particularly in areas such as Tata Steel where we had the blast furnace. Has your government actually given any further consideration of looking at the relief of plant and machinery in the business rates to ensure that investment can come into the industries such as the steel industry and will not be penalised as a consequence? It is something that we've looked at with the Valuation Office Agency. It is a highly complicated area. Uh, what we have done instead, of course, is to put on the table a more generous package for Tata than uh, business rate relief uh, would, would offer. Uh, so I would uh, argue that uh, what we have on the table goes well beyond uh, what uh, uh, business rate relief on plant and machinery would be able to offer in the first place, especially given the complexities and the time it would take to put such a system in place. Russell George. Yeah, yeah. In light of your answer to me last week, First Minister, saying that you would be able to give full consideration after the autumn statement to increasing funding for support to small businesses. Um, how will your government use the uh, budget consequentials from the Chancellor's announcement uh, that he will extend rural rate relief to 100%, giving small businesses in England a tax break of worth up to 2,900? Well, the revenue consequential is very small, some £35 million, pounds, of which £20 million pounds have already been, has already been announced. Uh, so we have not been showered with largesse from the UK government when it comes to, to revenue funding. Nevertheless, we will look to see uh, how that money can be best used for the good of the people of Wales. Neil McAvoy. Uh, First Minister, I've had countless constituents write to me about business rates, small business holders, people running independent shops, and they're all telling me that your government's business rates are threatening their businesses, may lead them to close or certainly lay people off. Why are you hurting small businesses in my region? Uh, well, uh, I, I think the member has to remember that the, the, the last time there was a revaluation was at the time of the, uh, when his party was in government. I heard no complaints uh, at that point. It's right to say that in some parts of Wales uh, there are particular issues that will need to be addressed, but this is revenue neutral. Uh, this is not a way of um, the, the government getting more money. Uh, this is uh, a way of rebalancing the business rates system without there being a net gain to government. That said, of course, uh, we recognise uh, that there will be some parts of Wales uh, where things are difficult, and that's why we've already announced a transitional relief scheme of £10 million, and we will look to see what else we can do uh, in order to, to smooth the transition process. Question in our gun, Arwain, where a play dear Arwainith Group UKIP Neil Hamilton. Uh, the government will be represented at the Supreme Court hearing next week on the case involving Article 50, and that's perfectly reasonable. The Welsh Government's views uh, should be presented to the court. But what instructions will be given to counsel for the Welsh Government? Will he be or she be? Uh, supporting the, uh, the government of the United Kingdom, or will he or she be supporting the claimants against the government of the United Kingdom, i.e. will he be helping to facilitate the wishes of the British people as expressed in the referendum on the 23rd of June, or the opposite? Neither. The Welsh Government will be representing itself, and the instructions to Council will be given on the basis uh, of representing the Welsh Government's uh, position. This is not to do with uh, preventing Brexit. It's to do, to, it's to do with making sure that constitutional law is observed. 
Well, <laughs> there is an argument, of course, as to what the constitutional law requires in this particular instance. What I'm, what I'm, try, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to elicit fr from the First Minister is on whose side is he going to be on the view which is held by the United Kingdom government or the view held by counsel for Mrs. Miller, who is the applicant in this case. Uh, there are sound legal arguments for saying that an explicit vote of the House of Commons is not required before triggering Article 50. In 2008 and in 2011, an Act of Parliament was passed to amend uh, UK legislation to require explicitly a vote in Parliament if there were to be any specific changes to EU law in some areas like common defence policy, the appointment of a European prosecutor, whether Britain should join the Euro, whether Britain should join the Schengen Agreement, whether we should replace the voting by unanimity by qualified majority voting and a whole range of incidents. In all those instances, there would be direct effects upon the British people uh, as a consequence of the decision. That's the essence of the High Court's decision. It's because of those direct effects upon people that an explicit vote in Parliament is, is required. But as Article 50 was not one of the many instances which were set down in an Act of Parliament, then there is certainly no basis for saying that in this case there is an implied requirement for the House of Commons and all the House of Lords to support uh, a vote in favour of Article 50 before the government is enabled to fulfil the wishes of the British people. Uh, well, if the leader of UK was pitching to act as counsel in the Supreme Court, he's doing a reasonable job for himself. He understands uh, the, the, the constitutional issue, but it has to be resolved in court. Um, we will all have our different positions. The question for us is, can the royal prerogative be used to start what would be an unstoppable process towards changing the constitution of Wales? Uh, there are serious legal arguments that need to be explored in the Supreme Court. Uh, he has recognised that. I welcome that. Uh, unfortunately, there are some in his party who see this as some kind of conspiracy to stop Brexit. That is not what this is about. This is about ensuring that a, uh, an important constitutional legal principle is examined and judgment given on that, not just for Brexit, but of course this could be used in the future for, for, for other issues as well. Indeed, and uh, uh, so what I'm trying to elicit from the First Minister, and which he still has not uh, uh, given an answer to, uh, what will counsel for the Welsh Government actually be saying in the course of these proceedings? Because counsel for the Government said nothing in the High Court at all. Uh, is it intended that counsel for the Welsh Government will say something in the Supreme Court hearing? And if so, will he be arguing against the case of the United Kingdom Government that we should go ahead and trigger Article 50 as soon as possible without complicating matters by having further votes in Parliament? Well, I mean, he's perfectly welcome to read the, the grounds which are public, uh, and he will see uh, the case that we make. We, we, are, <laughs> we represent ourselves. We are not there to back one side nor the other, but to put a case on behalf of the people of, of Wales in terms of what constitutional principles should be followed. It just so happens that Brexit is the issue, but there could be any other issue where this constitutional principle would need to be examined, so it's important that it's examined now. Arwenydd Plai Cymru, Leanne Wood. First Minister, a ban on letting agents fees was announced in the recent autumn statement announcement with England now joining Scotland. When it comes to Wales, your finance secretary told the BBC that he wanted to wait and see how the ban in Scotland worked first. Do you know which year they banned letting agent fees in Scotland? Yes, the position of Scotland is, uh, is this, that uh, the Rent Scotland Act 1984 makes the payment of any premium in respect of granting renewal or continuance of a protected tenancy and offence. That definition has been in place since the 30th of November of 2012, uh, and so practically it's since 2012 that has been in place. I can say, however, uh, that we, while we are looking again at this issue, our fear was that if uh, fees were abolished and that would be loaded onto rents, uh, the evidence of Scotland is interesting in that regard, and I know this is an issue that my colleague Jane Rathbone has been particularly uh, concerned about, uh, given the effect on her constituency. I'm glad you, you raised that point um, uh, about Scotland, because the, uh, the banning of let-in fees there has shown by the ONS that rents in uh, Scotland and Wales rose at a substantially lower rate than in England over the past six years, with rents in Scotland actually falling over the past years. So it shows that uh, these ban on let-in fees doesn't actually uh, increase rents. Now, 
You're right, um, Scotland banned these fees in 2012. So how much longer do tenants in Wales have to wait then? I would have thought that four years um, was long enough. The fact is that you've been even slower on this vitally important social justice question than even the Tories in Westminster. Now, First Minister, home ownership is becoming a crucial issue for this generation of young people, becoming almost impossible to get on the property ladder. Getting their rent paid is now the top priority. And in the rented sector, moving home can bring about a set of unjustified fees with Shelter Cymru's mystery shopping exercise a few years ago, suggesting that it can cost up to £1,000 extra. Unless action is taken, it will only be Wales that will have these let-in fees. I would welcome a firm commitment from you this afternoon, First Minister, explaining to us how you are going to ban these let-in let agent fees. Will you give us that commitment today? Uh, I can say this is something that is actively under consideration. I understand the point that she makes. It would look uh, strange for Wales to have let-in agent fees while England and Scotland <laughs> didn't. Uh, there is some evidence now from Scotland that the uh, effect in terms of increases, in terms of rental increases, was not as great as was feared, and that is something that will play in uh, very strongly to uh, the action we will take over the next few months. First Minister, last year Plaid Cymru tabled amendments to the Rent in Homes <coughs> Bill, but you declined at that point to uh, take up the opportunity to ban excessive let-in fees, apparently against the wishes of your own backbenchers. And banning excessive letting agency fees is not the only issue that your backbenchers have wanted to vote with Plaid Cymru amendments to improve legislation. We've wanted to ban zero hours contracts in social care. But there's always, there always seems to be an excuse, First Minister. Either you don't have the power, or the amendment wasn't drafted correctly, or my favourite, we haven't consulted on the issue, even after 17 years of being in power. Why is it, First Minister, that when Plaid Cymru tries to implement policies that help those on the lowest incomes get out of poverty, your government votes against us? Well, I do remember that her party was in government uh, for four years, which is often conveniently uh, forgotten. Uh, and there will be issues, the issue of zero's contrast attached to, to the social services bill, if I remember rightly, uh, was an issue. The fear was the entire bill would, would be referred to the Supreme Court. Not an issue of disagreement on principle, and not in the slightest, far from it. We're in the same place when it comes to zero hours uh, contracts. Uh, in the same way, we, have, we will revisit the issue of uh, letting agents' fees in the light of the evidence that uh, is there from Scotland through Shelter. Uh, and uh, it is right to say uh, that uh, it would look uh, unusual for Wales to have letting agents fees with England and Scotland not. Uh, the concern that we had that this would simply be added to rents appears from the evidence uh, in Scotland now to be less of a concern than before. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. First Minister, if I could return to the first question today on sepsis, uh, and I'd like to commend my colleague Angela Burns, yeah, who now yeah. cha chairs the All Party Group uh, on this particular issue. After going through some pretty horrendous experiences herself, she's able to bring those personal experiences to the table. Uh, this is an issue that, obviously, through recent media coverage, really has come to the forefront of people's thinking, but has been quietly lurking in the background in health professionals' minds for quite some time. And in fairness to the Welsh Government, they've brought forward a strategy uh, to try and tackle some of the areas that people do face uh, when they present and want to be assessed in hospital. But it is a fact that only one in ten people are receiving the right treatment and the right assessments in hospitals. What type of target can we aim for this time next year? Because I hear the warm words, and rightly the words that people want to hear, but they actually want to hear progress on this particular issue. So what progress can we specifically hold you to on screening and treatment in 12 months' time, yeah. First Minister? Well, it's part of the Thousand Lives uh, programme that we have to make sure that more people are given uh, the chance to uh, survive and given the chance to have the right level of treatment for the illness itself. Uh, he asks, are there any particular figures in terms of a target? The answer is no, there's no particular figure. But what I can say is we want to see more people diagnosed early to give them the opportunity of surviving. Uh, we have already in place, as I said, the uh, early warning score system, the se sepsis six uh, uh, analysis, uh, analysis scheme as well. Uh, we believe that all these things taken together will increase awareness of sepsis, particularly awareness amongst medics, so that they are able to diagnose more quickly uh, and therefore more people are diagnosed and therefore will, be, will, will survive. 
Thank you for that, First Minister. I was specifically looking for a target from yourself as the First Minister and the government. Um, I appreciate there might not be hard and fast figures at the moment, but the figure I did put to you is at the moment only one in ten patients are actually receiving that screening uh, and that support that most probably would help uh, and actually save their lives. Now, that's a figure none of us want to uh, leave at. We want to push that on. And you have the ability as a government to push on from that figure. And when you actually think that 15 times more people are killed by sepsis in Wales or die from sepsis in Wales than in road accidents. We've had a huge programme, a successful programme of road traffic safety, road traffic information. This is an area that the Welsh Government need to be at the forefront of and delivering tangible results within our health service. Pockets of good practice are just not good enough, as was identified in the recent report. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll use my second question of three, if I may, to try and push you to try and get a hard figure out of you of where we will be this time next year when it comes to hospitals screening for sepsis and actually being able to deliver the treatments that are required. Well, there is already a consistent approach through the National Early Warning Score uh, system that is in place across all hospitals in Wales. It's widely used by staffing community hospitals and in residential homes for the elderly and indeed in mental health services. I mentioned earlier that the ambulance service is developing systems for screening patients for sepsis prior to uh, arrival. Belindra uses uh, the system across all its clinical areas and outpatient chemotherapy units, ensuring that it meets the needs of cancer uh, patients. Uh, and then, of course, I mentioned the, uh, the sepsis 6 bundle. What does that mean in terms of numbers? Well, we work with the UK Sepsis Trust. It's a very good working relationship. We want to see that figure of one out of 10 improve in the future so that more people have a chance of survival, and we're confident that will happen. I appreciate it. I don't seem to be able to get a figure out of you today, First Minister. And I have paid tribute to the actions the government have taken so far, but it is quite clearly identified that there are only pockets of good practice, regrettably, in the Welsh NHS. I've given you the figure of one in ten, and I've given you the figure that 15 times more people die of sepsis than of road accidents. Uh, so I would hope that maybe either the Cabinet Secretary could make a written statement uh, to indicate where the government wants to be in 12 months' time so that we can see how open his mind is to actually bring forward real progress in this area. But one area where real progress can be made is in the recruitment and retention of doctors and medical staff. And I appreciate, again, this is a UK-wide issue, this is, and in certain disciplines it's more pronounced in other parts of the United Kingdom than maybe here in Wales. But regrettably, the Royal College of Surge Surgeons have pointed out that 40% of consultant posts are vacant here in Wales, and many of them do not actually uh, attract vacant positions. I'm talking about not actually staff positions. 40% of vacancies do not receive any reply to the adverts put out there. What progress will the Welsh Government be doing and undertaking over the next 12 months to actually attract and retain clinicians to our NHS so that when it comes to sepsis and other conditions, we have the expertise at the coalface to actually deliver those diagnoses to improve treatments for patients entering the NHS here in Wales? I'm not quite sure where you get the 40% figure from. The uh, figure or the vacancy figure is around 4% in the, uh, the Welsh NHS. Uh, we continue to be proactive in our recruitment. Uh, we've been in London and Harrogate at events uh, recently in order to uh, present Wales as a good place to be a doctor. We've had, uh, at the last count, 280 uh, very hard uh, and solid responses and inquiries uh, to our campaign. It's a very good campaign. Uh, and we are confident that we will be able to uh, attract the uh, physicians at all levels and surgeons at all levels into the Welsh uh, NHS uh, to make sure that our people get the service that they require. Question three, Russell George. Yeah, yeah. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's role in the formation of local development plans? Yes, the Government proactively engages with the local planning authorities to ensure national planning policy as set out in PPW and associated TANs is appropriately reflected in LDPs. Uh, thank you for your answer, First Minister. You will be aware uh, that the Welsh Government uh, published letters to Chief Planning Officers which supplement uh, Welsh planning policy in Wales. Can you confirm whether or not these letters constitute Welsh Government planning policy which local authorities are obliged to follow, or whether they are merely guidance and advice which can be accepted or rejected in the formation of LDPs? Also, I would be grateful if you could set out what pressure the Welsh Government has exerted on Powys County Council 
in directing them to include local search areas for renewable energy schemes above and, uh, above, over and above existing strategic search areas across the county. Well, we have not directed Powys uh, Council to amend their LDP. Government officials have engaged with Powys County Council to provide advice and guidance on national policy, including uh, renewable energy, uh, and uh, including responding uh, at formal cons consultation uh, stages. Uh, councils, of course, uh, authorities do have to bear in mind the guidance that comes from Welsh Government, because, of course, that guidance will be taken into account when the LDP is examined by the inspector, who, of course, has the final say as to whether an LDP is accepted or not. Neil McAvoy. Um, First Minister, your, your government's role in Cardiff's LDP is to plan to dump thousands of dwellings on our countryside. Uh, Cardiff Plaid will make sure that Cardiff Council passes a motion to demand that the Assembly revokes Cardiff's local destruction plan. Will you support that motion to save Cardiff's greenfields? It's a legal nonsense as well, he knows. Uh, he doesn't like income as much, does he? You know, it's one of the things that uh, we, we do notice about him. He doesn't like people coming to live in Cardiff, and uh, he has to consider which, which party he should be a member of, but that's a matter for him. The reality is that it's for local authorities to adopt their LDPs. Uh, it's for local authorities to, to decide what to do with their LDP, as the Assembly has no legal role or power to rescind the LDP of a local authority, nor can there ever be a vote on the floor of this chamber to rescind an LDP. It's a matter of local democracy uh, that a local council can produce its uh, LDP, taking into account national planning policy and taking into account uh, what the inspector says as part of that LDP uh, process. And that's exactly what Cardiff Council have done. Question Pedwar, David Rowlands. Yeah, uh, First Minister, given that a large proportion of all Irish exports uh, both to the UK and you need the to ask EU, the pass along the M4 motorway. You need to ask the question on the order paper. I, I'm sorry. It, well, it, it, I just missed uh, two of the words or something out of it. If I, if I have, I, I apologise to you. Just to ask the question Minister, again. But the whole ethos of the uh, thing. Right, I'll start again, First Minister. Uh, will the First Minister explore the possibility of part of the cost for the M4 improvement scheme being borne by the Irish Government, given that three quarters of all Irish exports to the EU and UK pass along that road? No, it's for the Welsh Government to uh, maintain the uh, trunk roads and motorways of Wales. Well, I, I, I thank the First Minister for the answer, but this is a serious proposition. As I understand, Ireland may be able to access funds from the Trans-European Highways Fund. <laughs> Very ironic. And here I quote, and here, and here, and here I, I am quote interested in hearing the allocation question. principles. Although we have been investing a lot in improving transport infrastructure, there is underinvestment in many smaller I can't sections hear the question, and, and I don't think the First Minister can. Can everybody quiet him down, please? Can you ask the question again? I, th I don't think. And I love well, it to uh, be. Uh, uh, I want to I, I'm, glad, I'm glad they, they realise uh, uh, what they're saying and uh, that we now can get funds uh, from the EU. Uh, post Brexit, of course. Uh, I shall start again, First Minister. I thank the First Minister for his answer, but this is a serious proposition. As I understand, Ireland may be able to access funds from the Trans European Highways Fund. And here I quote fund allocation principles. I have Although asked we have been investing for this question a lot to be heard quietly, can everybody allow this question to be heard? I want to get to the end of this question. <laughs> and so do I, Sawi. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> there is underinvestment in many smaller cross border sections and bottlenecks. I trust the First Minister would agree. The M4 at Bryn Glass would certainly qualify for description bottleneck. Well, um, the member seems to be urging uh, on me uh, that I should uh, urge the Irish government to apply for European funding to pay for Welsh roads. 
Uh, he has uh, been a member of a party and indeed campaigned in June to end European funding for Welsh roads. He cannot, I suggest, now go to, another Europe, to an EU member state and ask them to make up the shortfall that he himself campaigned to engineer in the first place. There's a second point as well. We must be very careful here in the sense that, that England could turn around and say, well, you know, the M4 goes across the Severn Bridge. Uh, a, a, a lot of traffic goes across, well, all the traffic that goes across the Severn Bridge goes to Wales. Much of the M4 is used by Welsh traffic, therefore there should be a Welsh contribution to the M4 east of the Severn Bridge. The French authorities could say, well, the vast majority of freight that comes from the UK goes through Calais, so the UK government should pay for port infrastructure in Calais and the roads that lead from Calais. You know, where does the argument end? No, we have to be uh, responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of our, of our own roads in our own countries. Uh, Diolch, uh, shall we? The, uh, th this is a surreal question, even by the standards of this uh, year. But uh, I must say, Mr. Owens' question is reminiscent of a chap that once had a plan to build a wall around his country and build, and build his next-door neighbours uh, for the work. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to that gentleman. In terms of future cooperation between Wales and Ireland on infrastructure projects, um, there is a potential scope for a formal arrangement, a bilateral arrangement between Wales and Ireland through the Belfast Agreement, where uh, one or more two or more members can enter into bilateral agreements together. Will the First Minister consider a formal arrangement with the Irish state so that we can have future joint working on infrastructure projects, even oh. tapping in, dare I say, the European funding, so that we can formalise it into a Celtic Sea alliance <laughs> that gives some hope to our western regions and the eastern regions of the Irish state? Yes, the, the Celtic Sea Alliance is based on, I think, the, uh, the cooperation between Norway and Sweden uh, as a model as to how that would work. Uh, it is likely that we will lose interreg funding, as far as Wales is concerned, which will have an effect particularly on our, on our ferry ports, and I'm keen to explore uh, new relationships uh, uh, around the Irish Sea, whether it's with the Republic, um, Northern Ireland, with the Isle of Man, uh, to see how we can help to ensure that uh, there is minimal disruption when the UK leaves the European Union. And of course, uh, the uh, British Irish Council a is a useful body in terms of exploring some of these issues uh, with those countries that border the Irish Sea. Question pen, Jenny Rathbone. Uh, the leader of Plaid Cymru has already stolen my question, but I'll ask it for the record anyway. In light of the measures announced in the autumn awesome statement, will the Welsh Government consider joining... Sorry, sorry. Um, questions are not stolen in this place. <laughs> Somebody's asked your question before you got, you got to it. So just ask the question on the order paper. In light, in, light of the, in light of the measures announced in the autumn statement, will the Welsh Government consider joining England and Scotland in banning letting agency fees? Yes, it, 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 it's, a, it's a matter of uh, where questions are asked, of course, uh, when these, these things uh, arise, but I, I give the member the same answer that I gave to uh, the leader of, of Plaid Cymru, which is we are studying the impact of the ban in Scotland, uh, and together with the final details of proposals in England, we will inform, that will inform any action that we uh, take, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I thank the member for the advocacy she has shown for so many tenants in her constituency. Uh, where they have been uh, exploited over, over some years, and that is a matter I know that she uh, has been uh, very, very active in combating. Just to put in detail, of that issue, um, I've got information that citizens advise say the average tenancy fee is £337. Shelter says that 15% of renters are using an agency where they've had to uh, pay up £500 or more. And tenants in Cardiff has said that fees are around £450. Too many agents, certainly operating in my constituency, are charging exploitative levels of fees, frequently far in excess of the actual cost, and also uh, putting on hidden fees, often on people who are very young and are tentatively working their way through what are their rights. Um, you can charge £60 or more for a credit check. Uh, a cost that the firm will be doing for as little as five pounds, and the renewal fee for staying in the same property can be as high as three hundred pounds, when it amounts to little more than printing off a contract to sign. So too many unscrupulous agents have got away with excessive fees and double charging landlords. And I just want to refer the First Minister to a um, report from Shelter, that Shelter's research, that shows that it isn't just the ONS, that landlords in Scotland were no more likely to have increased rents since 2012 
than landlords elsewhere in the UK. So can you confirm that the Welsh Government has not ruled out action to prevent letting agents charging exorbitant and hidden fees? Yes, I can confirm that. Uh, the member, of course, makes a strong case uh, for the abolition of such uh, fees. I know that the Minister is uh, actively looking at how this can be taken forward in uh, the future and examining uh, the emerging evidence from Scotland. Bethan Jenkins. Uh, First Minister, there seemed to have been some confusion at the time um, of the, when we debated this previously in the previous Assembly over whether you had the powers or not. And I, I am understanding that you were able to give backbench um, <coughs> Labour Assembly members advice to suggest that it wasn't, in fact, legal for you to do so, something which wasn't shared to the rest of us as part of that particular debate. I would like to ask uh, here today, uh, First Minister, if you are minded to bring forward um, any future debate or any future legislation, if you could um, put forward that advice um, to the Assembly so that we can uh, analyse it independently so we can assess uh, the way forward because we seem to be hearing one thing from backbenchers and another from government. Uh, well, um, the, the member is not, not a member of uh, the group on, on this side of the, uh, the chamber uh, and uh, how she is aware of what, what was and wasn't said is, is a matter of her. But what I can say is that anything is potentially open to challenge because of the inadequate nature of a devolution settlement, which is why uh, even though the opportunity hasn't been grasped properly by the UK government, we need to make sure there is greater uh, clarity. Uh, we will look to proceed on the basis uh, that we will do for the people of Wales, what is proposed in England and in Scotland. The fact that the government, the UK government in England, uh, I would argue, has already conceded in any event that they believe this is devolved, because they've only uh, talked about England in, in this regard, uh, is something that, that is, of course, uh, helpful uh, to any future potential reference to the Supreme Court. David Manley. Um, First Minister, I mean, these uh, fees are something of a horror. There aren't many goods and services. We actually get charged for the process of purchase. And uh, there's clear support all around the House uh, for action to be taken on this. But these fees do distort the market. Uh, they're a disincentive to the mobility uh, of labour. And the clear experience in Scotland is that the charges would be absorbed by those offering uh, uh, homes to rent, which is where they've traditionally been. Uh, I, I don't argue against what the member has, uh, has said. Uh, that evidence uh, that uh, Shelter has produced in terms of Scotland is uh, useful and strong evidence that will inform the way forward as far as Wales is concerned. Question Gareth Bennett. Um, what discussions has the Welsh Government had with rail authorities about delays to services caused by compacted leaves on the line? Well, this isn't, of course, a devolved issue, but underperformance by Network Rail in providing quality public services is not acceptable. Uh, we will continue to call for devolution of rail power so we can have greater accountability uh, for railway services provided in Wales. Uh, thanks for that, First Minister. Um, yes, I'm aware it's a problem that is essentially um, dealt with by Network Rail. Are there regular channels of communication between the Welsh Government and Network Rail? Yes, there are. Um, they, well, I've met with Network Rail, but the, the more regular uh, channel of communication will be between officials and Network Rail. Uh, it is not acceptable uh, that uh, services should be curtailed in this way. The problem is uh, that uh, if there are compacted leaves on the line, it's an, old, it's an old joke, but the reality is what happens is if a train skids, it can actually damage the wheels to the extent the wheels have to be reground. So actually it takes the entire locomotive out of action uh, and potentially carriages as well because of that effect. Uh, I would not want to think that Network Rail are not spending as much money as they should be doing on trackside maintenance, thus causing more leaves to fall. That is something uh, that we will need to uh, talk to Network Rail about in order to, to rule out that possibility. Jeremy Miles. Um, the First Minister will be aware of comments by the UK Transport Secretary a few weeks ago uh, that pressing for the electrification of the rail line from Cardiff to Swansea was jumping the gun, and most recently comments by the Chair of Network Rail that it was not a done deal. He'll appreciate that my constituents in Neath, and I dare say those are colleagues west of Cardiff, mm -hmm. will hear that as a rowing back on previous commitments by the UK Government. Absolutely. I wonder if you can outline what steps the Welsh Government can take to press the UK Government to hold its commitments. These are promises that were given, that there will be electrification. Um, this, originally, of course, the promise was electrification as far as Cardiff and then from Bridgend to Swansea. I wonder what I'd done, the UK Government, that there should be a gap between my constituency and, uh, and Cardiff. Uh, in reality, it was because they failed to realise there are actually two railway lines between the, uh, between the two settlements. 
Uh, well, that promise was given. I expect that promise to be kept. On top of that, it is quite clear that Cardiff Central Railway Station needs a, a significant revamp in order for it to be fit for the future. Uh, and I expect to see, I would want to see, uh, the UK Government making the right level of contribution to uh, Network Rail's plans for that station as, as well. Uh, it is not good enough, on the one hand, to say the railways cannot be devolved, and on the other hand, not spend enough money on Welsh railways. Uh, the UK Government can't have it both ways. Di Lloyd. Diolchlywydd, ac sy'n i'n cefnogi yn y Tyriol y Sylwada, mae Jeremy Miles newydd eid ynglyn â'r angen dybryd i drydanydd o'r prif reilffordd i Abertawe. Da ni wedi rhaid ni bod yn dadlau am hynna ers ddegawd a mwy. Ond mae'r cwestiwn gwreiddiol yn ein ynglyn â dail ar y lein. Yn y Tyriol, da ni'n cael hydref bob blwyddyn, mae'r dail yn cwmpo bob blwyddyn, a dwi'n deall y pwynt bod y system yma ddim wedi gleid atgenoli. Dwi'n gwybod sy'n rhoi ni wedi dweud hynna wrth y dail, ond dwi'n credu bod yna sgôp yma yna ni ar loesu mewn trafodaethau i wneud siŵr bod ni'n dweud fynnu fo atebion sy'n cael gwared o'r broblem yma unwaith ag anbeth. Wel, mae'n hollol iawn, wrth gwrs. Ond beth sy'n bwysig yw bod Network Rail yn sicrhau bod yna ddigon o waith yn cael ei wneud, er mwyn sicrhau bod coelwyr yn cael ei dorri yn ôl i stopo dail i gwmpo ar y lein yn y lle cyntaf. Ar hyn o bryd, beth sydd ddim yn glir yw, a dyn yn wneud digon, er mwyn sicrhau bod y problem yn cael ei leihau wrth goffi o'r ffaith bod ni yn gwybod bod dail yn cwmpo bob blwyddyn yn wlad hyn o'r anfwyo'r coelwyr. Mark Isherwood. I contacted Arriva Trains Wales after disruption to services on the Wrexham visitor line at the end of October caused by Lee Fall and weather conditions. They replied that they have been trying to overcome the issue for a number of years and working in partnership with colleagues on the line to try and reduce the effect to their customers. They produced a paper in March of this year, supported by local user groups, bodies on the line, but unfortunately it wasn't supported by the Welsh Government. Why was that, First Minister? It's not correct. Uh, uh, what, what he... What he is suggesting, I mean, he points out actually something that there is a weakness in the system. That is that the rail track operator and owner is, is divorced from the actual train company, but that is a system his own party put in place. Uh, it would be a far better system, to my mind, uh, where uh, the, uh, the train operating company and the rail track uh, operator and owner were one and the same body, so one can't blame the other uh, if there are any disruptions to services. But that is a system his party put in place and want to preserve. Why wouldn't you support Question Scythe, Nick Ramsey. How does the First Minister plan to utilise additional funding for Wales resulting from the autumn statement? Well, our focus will be on restoring in part the previous cuts to our capital budget imposed by the UK Government and delivering our investment priorities as set out in taking Wales forward. Uh, thank you. First Minister, the autumn statement will deliver over £400 million over the next five years for infrastructure. Uh, good news. Will you make sure that all areas of Wales benefit from this extra funding, including rural areas like Monmouthshire, and my constituency, which receives one of the lowest local government settlements, but which would really benefit from additional investment in infrastructure projects and projects like the Cardiff City deal and the, and the South Wales Metro? Well, I mean, Mammothshire is part of both projects, of course. Mammothshire is part and an active part of the, uh, of the Cardiff, City, uh, Cardiff Capital Region deal. Uh, and certainly the leader of Mammothshire has been somebody who's been very uh, proactive in, uh, in moving that deal forward. Uh, and also the Metro. Uh, there are opportunities for uh, Mammothshire to benefit from the Metro, uh, particularly uh, as we look to improve bus services and possibly light rail services into his constituency in the future. Leonard Morgan. Uh, the Government's autumn statement demonstrated a very blasé attitude by the Tories towards an impending uh, care crisis and their failure to provide for our increasingly uh, ageing population uh, means that there will be huge pressures now on the NHS. Will the First Minister make a commitment to work very closely with the Welsh Local Government Association to make sure that such a crisis does not uh, occur in Wales? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we already spend 6% more per head on health and social services in Wales than is the case in, in England. Uh, we never saw the sense uh, of taking money from social services in order to plug uh, gaps in health funding, which is what England did. Uh, you can't divorce one from the, uh, the other, and we will continue to ensure that there is sufficient funding for both. Adam Price. Some of the autumn statement money in England is going to be uh, used uh, um, to build hyper-fast uh, broadband uh, capability through fibre to the premises. 
isn't there an opportunity here for us in, in Wales as we, as we begin to think beyond superfast uh, Cymru, <coughs> instead of uh, investing in a privately owned monopoly, which is highly problematical, as Ofcom's decision today demonstrated, in creating uh, to create a, a publicly owned digital infrastructure network for Wales, something which his party leader at the UK level has recently called for for the UK? I think that's certainly worth exploring. Uh, the immediate objective is making sure that um, the current Superfast Cymru scheme is extended uh, and completed in the uh, in the middle of next year. Beyond that, of course, it's right to say that we can't sit back and say, well, that's it. We, <laughs> the technology will stay as it is for the next uh, five years, ten years, or the next two years. So, yes, it is hugely important to continue to invest in uh, greater bandwidth and greater speeds, of course, as far as broadband is concerned, and we'll continue to consider that. Question oedd Llyr Griffith. Uh, Without an eye for pre-wyn i dod dŵr yng Nghymru. Y mae e'n strategaeth ddŵr i Gymru yn dargan e'n polisi ar gyfer gwasanaethau dŵr yng Nghymru. Mae'r uh, sgrifennydd y cabinet dros yr ymgylchedd a materion gwledig yn cwrdd yn rheolaeth a'r diwydiant dŵr yng Nghymru drafod pob agwedd ar uh, wasanaethau dŵr a charth ffosaeth. Uh, will the First Minister join with me in uh, supporting calls for uh, a Phase 2 investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority into the proposed purchase of Dee Valley Water by uh, Seven Trent Water? Clearly, there are huge implications for customers and for jobs, especially in North East Wales, as, wide, uh, as well, of course, as wider implications for uh, the water industry here in Wales. And will you also uh, support uh, the appeal for existing shareholders to do what they can to retain those jobs in North East Wales and to ensure that Welsh water is run in future uh, from Wales and not from Coventry? Uh, I would not support uh, any uh, change that would, lose the, in the, that would result in the loss of Welsh jobs. The Competition and Markets Authority have launched an investigation <coughs> into the deal. Comments are invited by the 1st of uh, December, uh, and so uh, we will be looking to provide comments, as I'm sure other members will as well. No, I'll hold it. 